Is there any question more unfashionable to ask these days within the discipline of contemporary art history than what is the meaning of a work of art? In his book, The Shape of the Signifier, Walter Ben Michaels attempts to construct a genealogy of postmodernist indeterminacy. According to Michaels, the critical transformation of the art object or text from one in which the artist's intention is foregrounded to one that privileges the beholder's or reader's experience signals an aesthetic <clears throat> and political crisis. Our difficulty, he argues, to conceive of the possibility of a disinterested or non-subjectively grounded aesthetic engagement makes the assertion of a universal or definitive interpretation impossible and has abetted a dangerous evasion of our critical responsibility, not only as intellectuals, but as political subjects. Without denying the significant liberatory aspects of what could be considered the central postmodern strategies of indeterminacy through the suppression of, the suppression of authorial presence and the foregrounding of semantic contingency, the way these practices allowed previously marginalized subject positions to be visualized and articulated by decentering and de deconstructing normative and totalizing discourses. Michael's book offers a provocative, if often polemic, counter-narrative to what is often presented as a triumphant expansion of artistic and political possibilities, in turn allowing a reconsideration of the critical valence of these positions now nearly 50 years after their initial presentation. While the larger stakes of Michael's argument deal with how this post-structural critique of the sign led to the rise of identity politics and its implications for a neoliberalism that he argues refuses to engage with class difference, my own interest in his book, especially in terms of today's discussion and the essays by Latour and, Mike, uh, and Ranciere that Hal has selected, centers around the way it effectively historicizes the aesthetics of indeterminacy, whether understood as an ontological condition, as deconstructive or post-structuralist readings would have it, or as an artistic and political strategy as practiced by critical postmodern artists. If postmodernism can be generally understood as a critical skepticism regarding the question of reference, Latour and Ranciere seem to me to be proposing a realist response to what might, what might be called the bad dream of postmodernism, the way these once critical strategies seem to have become sclerotic, co-opted by the right and leaving the left paralyzed and unable to act with conviction. Drawing upon Latour's closing appeal for a realist approach to critical practice, I want to bring realism into our discussion today as a means to think about the continued relevance of representation, reference, and history in art historical discourse. In fact, I think the concept of realism may be an effective way to consider the relevance of the social history of art for contemporary art, a subject that is surprisingly almost entirely absent from the readings selected by the panelists. For a paradigmatic postmodernist like Roland Barthes, realism was famously an effect that naturalized what was in fact cultural, demonstrating the inevitable slippage between sign and signified, not only in the overtly fictional practices of aesthetic production, but also, and perhaps more insidiously, in seemingly objective and empirical discourses like history. Understood in these terms, social art history improvidently constructs new mystified layers of discourse upon the work of art, a code upon a code, producing, an, uh, producing a maison en beam of discursive formations and moving the critic further from the work under analysis. For Bart and others um, who follow in his footsteps, rather than decipherment, which can never reach its proposed origin, the task for postmodern critics would be evaluation and analysis of the system that, produce, that produces such reality effects, or in what could be called its celebratory mode, exposition of the ways in which the work of art challenges the symbolic itself through various strategies of indeterminacy and self-reflexivity. One might say that such practices allow the postmodern critic to say what he or she um, means by paradoxically asserting that the text can never mean what it says, or again, in the more celebratory mode by bracketing the unwieldy contingencies of history so that the work's meaning resides wholly within its own formal structure. 
If postmodern theory has effectively shown that the content of realism is always already a construction, and thus false, Rancière and Latour propose that such constructedness needn't be seen negatively, but rather as a creative opportunity. If postmodernism has taught us that there is no outside the text, critical tactics that seeking to uncover and enlighten will be inoperable within this terrain. Rancière suggests how art's capacity needn't be one of uncovering illusions, but rather about making visible to, as he puts it, reconfigure the landscape of what can be seen and what can be thought. This concept can be aligned with Latour's description of the critic as one who assembles and offers the participants arenas in which to gather. If for postmodern theorists, this additive pastiche-like aspect of realism was seen to postpone any access to the factual basis of the text as system, a, if one would call it a neo-realist approach, uh, would uh, provide a means to articulate matters of concern rather than fact, use uh, Latour's words. Realism, understood as the, as the gradual and provisional modification of discourse in response to external conditions, thus offers an al alternative model to the modernist and postmodernist strategies of negation. If Michael suggests that the end of modernism entails the, the end of our capacity to engage in winnable arguments, because the stakes of the arguments are wholly subjective uh, about experience, uh, leading to the impossibility of imagining communities beyond subjective identities. Ranciere provides a new model where community entails a collective acceptance of provisional but practicable fictions, constantly reconfigured to keep from falling into mythic totality and stasis. A model, I would argue, that was already um, posited by Leo Steinberg in his 1962 essay, Contemporary Art in the Plight of the Public. Steinberg, that great debunker of modernist aesthetics, already knew that art's greatest virtue was not its criticality per se, but its capacity to destroy old values by constructing new ones, to posit other criteria. A capacity, I would argue, that is not without its own critical potential.